Good morning, Jane. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Absolutely fantastic. I have been dying to talk with you because you have lived the path. And we are in a moment of journalism where it's time to share the story or somebody else is going to write it for you. And you have shared your story in No Ordinary Assignment. I certainly have. I've, I've dug very deep for this book. What was that journey like? Because I'm a writer. I know what, what it does to the inside of my soul when it comes to putting words on a page. What was it like for you? Well, you know, most of my work is in TV, but I've also always been writing. I've been writing other people's stories. I write for The New Yorker, um, and I've been writing newspaper articles since the very early stages of my career. So I do enjoy writing, but writing about myself was hard. It is, I'm sure you, you, you've you experienced this too. I mean, how do you edit your own life story? Um, <laughs> and and it's been fascinating, you know, like I, I, I buried myself away in a library last summer um, to really, really, really dig deep. And I found myself kind of like walking through the corridors of my memory. And it's, it's a fascinating experience, you know, reliving some of these experiences and you relive the emotions as well for better or for worse. I'm with you on that. Oh, there have been many times where I've stopped because I, the emotions were so strong and that it's like, okay, get, get, get over it. You're, you're going to be okay. (laughs) Just get through this. Yeah. I, I think when you, when you feel that way, you're, you're on the right track too. Are there areas of your journey that, that you did not want to touch? Because I, I'm, I'm still having a hard time going back and, and reading what I wrote during 9-11. Because there, there are so many things that we've long forgotten that took place after that it's like, you know, it becomes too heavy to carry. For me, from the very get-go, and I write about this in the introduction to the book, you know, I, my intention was to be open and honest mm-hmm. and 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 very often you know that includes talking about your flaws and your mistakes and the things that 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 make you human so it was you know it's tempting to 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 do that but for me because i had set out a question at the very beginning of writing this which was why do i do this work and not just you know the kind of rote answer which is true but a little idealistic you know like well you know it's a true i want to speak truth to power and i and i and i and i you know i think that there's a tendency to 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 um to talk in a way where we we speak in broad strokes about the politics and the policy of what mm-hmm. we do as uh, 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 but not necessarily where does it come from on a personal level and you'll notice in the book there's sort of like there are two journeys there's a very personal journey and there's a professional journey and I didn't want to just write about my work. I wanted to write about the person who does this kind of work because I want the public to know, you know, we're, we're, we're living through an era where journalists are so often demonized or lionized as celebrities. And, and I just wanted them to see a real human being just doing their best. Not only that, but these AIs are coming in really super fast. And I, I, I'm, we've got to have journalists that are going to stand up and say, no, that's an AI. Here is the real story. And certainly that's an AI, but I'm actually there. <laughs> you know, I'm actually in that refugee camp or at that front line or in that hospital. So, you know, I don't think, you know, AI is, is it's inevitable. It will change the way information is absorbed and passed around and, 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 and formed into stories. But I don't think it can really, you know, compensate for me being there. And, uh, you know, I think humans want to hear stories told by mm-hmm. humans. You know, mm-hmm. they can hear information told by AI, but stories or for humans. How is it that you were able to share a story inside the book, No Ordinary Assignment, and not sound like a reporter or a journalist? I mean, you really do show some emotion inside these pages. For me, I wasn't writing it as a journalist. I didn't want, you know, the the reader to, to read Jane Ferguson, PBR, PBS NewsHour, or <laughs> The New Yorker. It was, you know, I feel like I owe the reader more than that. I owe them Jane Ferguson, you know, kid on a farm in Ireland. Jane Ferguson trying her best to to save some money for college at a chicken factory. Jane Ferguson, you know, who has no idea what she's doing, trying to use this video camera in Somalia, age 24. (laughs) So I'm, I owe the audience that, and, and I suppose from a technical standpoint, the way I looked at it as I was writing the book was, well, what I should do is I should bring them along with me 
to 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 hear and smell and feel and sense it just as I did. Yeah. And so to do that, I'm not speaking through the voice of hindsight. I'm not speaking as, you know, 38-year-old Jane who's had time to think about it all. You know, I'm trying to get them to see whether or not I'm a, I'm a child asking questions about the troubles in Ireland or whether I'm, you know, a youngster who just can't believe, you know, CNN just bought her first, you know, news story. I very much so try to speak in the voice of who I was then. Isn't it an amazing journey? Because I mean, the, the, what happens is, is that I mean, because I can still remember when I first got into broadcasting, and then where we are now. I don't ever want to go back there because you always hear of people that want to go back. No, mm. the, the experience of it all, and to be in those places. I mean, that, that's got to be something for you, where it's like, okay, this it's not a trophy; it's a mile marker, and we're going to create a chapter around this. Exactly. You know, I feel exactly the same way as you do. I don't look. I look back you know, with fondness at that young woman, you know, because you do get a little distance from yourself. I wonder if you experienced that as well, yeah. where I, I'm watching her do this and she's almost in the abstract. So I'm writing about her and, um, and I'm looking back and I'm thinking, God, she was so hard on herself. <laughs> <laughs> and that was really hard and she was doing her best. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I can see life as without meaning to be too corny about it it is a journey and i can see it as a journey that is additive so everywhere i'm 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 moving i'm learning and i'm growing and i'm moving i don't look back at those years as like my heyday or yeah, where i peaked yeah. and why you know, I feel nostalgia and I feel a, an emotional pull back to certain people and places, but I don't ever look back and, and think that's better than where I am. I look back and see that very much so as 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 the road to here. The two of us are still in that part of the story where people are starting to look at us saying, how much longer, how much longer? And and my answer always is, I, I don't have the courage to tell that 14-year-old person I was that I'm going to stop. That kid's dream is still alive in me. And it sounds like it, and I read it inside this book, that it's very much alive in you as well. It is. You know, so much of it throughout our journeys as journalists and as broadcasters is people people presume that every decision we make as youngsters is calculated and purposeful yep. and exactly what we wanted they forget that we're simply doing our best with whatever very very narrow options that we have so you know i look back at that young woman who's doing that work in the field and i see her as someone who didn't necessarily have a lot of choices professionally. She was just doing her best. I didn't pick and choose whatever assignment, whatever news organization I wanted to work for. So the only difference I would say now is that when you do get older and you get a little more success uh, in your career, you get the luxury of that. Yeah. So I never want to stop doing this work. I love the idea of being able to curate the stories that I do, you know, the ability to do some writing as well as as um, as as the the broadcasting and the TV. I take a little bit of time out to teach as well, mm -hmm. um, and I love being able to have all of these different experiences as well. When you, when you talk about teaching, how, how do you like today's modern day students? Because what, what I keep bumping into are people that think they're already a star because they've got a YouTube page or they're TikToking, and it's like it's like you're not there, man. You haven't you haven't even found your voice yet. I know. I do. I, I, I do sometimes uh, sort of I am astonished when I because I mentor a fair bit. You know, I talk to young reporters. I often, you know, um, go off and, and visit college campuses around the country and talk to, to journalism students. And and I do. I sometimes smile to myself because I recognize, you know, I can't, I can't be, you know, too, too, too superior. I had that little, little arrogance when I was younger. I was like, I can do this. So, you know, I, I recognize the attitude uh, there that, that little, like the, 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 the confidence, but I do sometimes laugh because I think, you know, you really don't know what you don't know. And once you get out into the field and everything falls through and someone pulls your visa and, you know, your car breaks down, you know, uh, nothing, nothing substitutes for experience. And I do tell young people that I'm teaching that as well, um, that, you know, absolutely nothing will substitute for being in the field and, and spending years doing the work. And and one thing also that I would say for, for young reporters that, that approach me 
for mentoring. And as you say, there's a sense that, oh, well, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm good to go. I, I sometimes I sometimes find that they often ask for connections and they really just want you to make a call yeah. and get them like, you know, <laughs> a, a commission or a job. But I'm always telling them, honestly, trust me, I know it's uncool and it's not part of the culture right now. I'm so glad that we talked about teaching. And the reason why is because in my notes here, it says, it says no ordinary assignment, universities and broadcasting schools need to teach this. And here we are talking about that we're both teachers, that we know know what we've experienced. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the next generation. So they too can learn how to move through the storms. And I very much so wrote the book with young people in mind. Oh, I was an outsider and I didn't come out of an Ivy League school and live in a big city or have any family connections. You know, I was just this hillbilly kid who, who didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know how to, you became a television reporter. I remember someone once asking me from CNN who my agent was and I was like, what do you mean agent? And so I had no idea. And so I think that's why it's important for young people to read these experiences of what it's like to actually build a career in journalism, the nuts and bolts of the challenges. And and I and I certainly hope, you know, young people who who are less confident, who don't know how they're going to do it, would, yeah. would read it. Yeah. A few minutes ago, you talked about the business side of journalism. And, and I want to put focus on that because you and I have gone through some changes in the past 10 to 15 years there. The platforms have expanded, but business leaders have tried to own us exclusively. How did you get through that mess? Because you are everywhere. And, and, and it's like, I'm, 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 it, it inspires me that you, you are here, you are there. You, and, and because so many people say, okay, I guess I'm owned by you. I'll stay here and do nothing but this. I have been fortunate enough throughout my career to be freelance. Good. So I have not, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, it, this wasn't the master plan. You know, when I was a kid, <laughs> all I dreamed of was being anointed with the validity <laughs> of being a network correspondent. And they'd hire me and give me a contract and I'd be theirs and they'd promote me. But it didn't work out that way. Um, you know, they didn't hire me. So I didn't quit because there was nothing else I ever wanted to do. This was my dream for since I was that little girl. So I just kept going. So the I ended up being blessed by that. My freelance career meant I could take the time to, you know, spend months prepping a major story, something like getting into Yemen during the Civil War, yeah. or I could turn around and, you know, pitch a story to the New Yorker and start writing for a magazine, you know, or I, I didn't, I was very fortunate. I didn't have to do shift work in between my assignments, which by the way, can, can add a lot of um, emotional and mental pressure mm -hmm. to journalists who just come home from a war zone. Instead of decompressing, they're back into an understaffed newsroom working 12 hour shifts or nine hour shifts. And so I was lucky to, to be able to do that, uh, you know, in, in the earlier years of my career, I didn't think it was luck. I thought it was misfortune. But I look back and realize I had so much control over my career as a result. Speaking of that decompression, boy, you bring up a great subject there because I call it post-production blues and I also call it defragging. How do you defrag when you've been to a situation like that? Because you've got to suffer from PTSD. I, I, I have the book. I see what you've been through. <laughs> you know, I, over the years, have massively prioritized uh, my mental and emotional health. I'm lucky to be coming from that generation where we're not so macho about therapy or decompression yep. anymore. Um, I saw a lot of older reporters, you know, those who I'd looked up to and lionized as a youngster, really struggle. And, you know, there was a sort of certain taboo amongst that set around seeing a therapist. People were afraid that if you ever if you ever even talked about yeah, PTSD, yeah. you'd be pulled off the road. Um, you, you know, you wouldn't be given assignments anymore. So luckily, that culture has changed. For me, when I come back from, from assignment, one thing I've learned is that I'm on I'm not detached. I'm very emotional when I'm on the road. I, I really, really feel a lot. But I don't feel all of it there's a little like there's 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 a certain level i get to and then i have to do my job and so i i can i don't try to detach instead i try to stay busy you know i'm not a voyeur and i'm certainly not a tourist i'm there to i have a role to play yep. and i have a job that might help in some way so that keeps me busy and so when i come home a i'm physically exhausted <laughs> beyond description and so once I start to come down from that and I take the time, what I tend to do is I really actually make an effort to allow myself to feel the feelings that I didn't. Okay. And sometimes it involves like sitting down and actually thinking about the individual people I talked to and how desperate their circumstances were. And I actually allow myself 
very much so to go there again. And I've described it before as the big cry. Um, and I often have a big cry. And this is an emotional release that's very, very important. The other thing that's worth pointing out is that, you know, people like myself, we rely on our loved ones. You know, we have friends who we talk to, especially within the industry, foreign correspondents. You know, we talk to one another. We, we support one another. We check in on one another when we know we've been on really rough assignments. Um, and I'm lucky to have you know, a, a, a partner and friends and, and, and family that, that really support me in that way. I, I love the way that you talk about the people that you make a part of the story, because one of the things that you've become a master at is is sharing the emotions of a real honest to God person. And it reminds me so much of my own photographer when I was at WBTV in the way that he said, he would always tell me, now I'm going to pan away from you. This isn't about you. It's about the yeah. scene. It's about yeah. the emotion. And he says, just keep doing what you're doing. Just let me do what I need to do as well. I love my photographer. Did you have someone like that? I've had plenty of incredible photographers and actually uh, who I have learned so much from. And actually, it's worth pointing out that a big part of being freelance and, you know, working at, at certain news organizations has meant I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of photographers from the countries that I'm reporting oh, on. Oh, my God. So, you know, uh, whether um, Afghan photographers and producers, Yemeni photographers and producers, Syrians, I've been fortunate enough to to learn from them and these are people who are living through this story to a certain extent themselves as well so you know i i have i have learned from my colleagues that i work with in the field vastly more than than anybody else um and you know i think that that the way you do that as you point out there is is just doing a lot of listening mm -hmm. you know less talking more listening mm -hmm. <laughs> you know um because that's that that's that's the job that's the work you bring something up in no ordinary assignment that i haven't heard in a very long long time and i want to know why it's gone away from history the ira my god that was a major part of my teenage life <laughs> well, major part of mine too, you know. I mean, I grew up in probably the last Protestant village before you got, or just outside it on a small farm, just before you got to the IRA heartlands of yeah. South Armagh, yeah. right on the border. You know, bandit country, they called it. I was born in 1984, so I was coming up uh, as a kid in the 80s and 90s. And to me, and I see this on the road everywhere I go now in, in conflict zones, as a child, you accept everything around you as perfectly normal. Yeah. This is what everyone does. When you drive down the road, there's the army with checkpoints and they have, you know, automatic weapons. And this is before 9-11, you know, whenever a lot of the Western world, you know, didn't have military on the streets or even or even police with automatic weapons, um, you know, bomb scares and, and explosions and the local police station blown up every few years. This was very, very normal for a kid growing up. And also, I would say perhaps even more impactful for me was a very divided and sectarian society. You know, I, I, I cover a lot of tribal sectarian divisions around wow. the world. And I, I grew up in the middle of that. Wow, you talk about all the traveling. Because I'm here in the South, I really do pay attention to people's accents. And, 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 and you've been accused of having the wrong accent. Oh my God, I mean, you, I mean, talk about being put on the spot. Well, you know, TV news is a very fickle business, yeah. and when, when, especially when I was coming up, you know, I it's part of my personal story as well. You know, I mean, I've always been a fish out of water. I was, you know, I, I didn't really feel like I fit in in this in, in in the area that I grew up in. I had this wanderlust. I wanted to see the world, and and then you know, and then I I ended up in in all different places around the world where I was always trying to fit in. And when I first started to work in American t uh, TV, I was told that, that they didn't want foreign accents. Yep. Um, and, and so, you know, I, throughout my life, there have been many moments where I've changed my accent. And so, you know, where, where I've had to for, for work. And, um, and yeah, so now it takes quite an expert ear to pick out Northern Ireland. Um, I mean, fairly transatlantic, I, I think, but still... Uh, uh, I, I sometimes bump into people who say, wait, 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 Australia. No, 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 Canada. <laughs> so um, so it's, it's just it's just a, a part of, of the sort of fickleness of television, I guess. Do you think our attraction to your stories and the reason why the world basically kind of just comes to a halt when one of your stories happens is because when you do your re your reporting, your journalist, um, is, is it because we see ourselves in the people that you're that you're interviewing or the stories that you're sharing? It's almost like, my God, this could be me. You know, sometimes, 
but not exclusively. I always say that my job is to remind people of other people's humanity. Yep. They yep. don't necessarily have to see themselves in another person's situation. You know, it can be impossible to, to for someone to relate to someone whose children are starving in a famine. That mm-hmm. That's just unthinkable in a literal sense for a lot of people watching. But I do try to remind them that, you know, of, of, of the humanity of another person. You know, you may not be able to relate to their situation, but you are, you know, perhaps a parent or you are someone who uh, who knows that 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 you know their grandparents fled war yeah. and can ex- can remember their tales of that um so yeah there are times when i'd really want people to to relate you know um but i think that all that i'm trying to really put across is you know humanity on the line and not uh, you know just death death tolls and numbers and figures and the best way to do that is to remind people that war is always experienced on a personal level you know you sit down with someone in a, in a refugee camp or a hospital or even just a neighborhood under bombardment and they don't tell you about the politicians and the geopolitics and this happened. You know, you sit down with a kid and they'll be like, well, I don't know, the cat's missing and we can't find her and dad went out and never came home and, and you know, like there's no food in the fridge and my brother keeps crying. Like people experience war on a personal level and that is relatable because anybody who has ever experienced a crisis, you know, can see that you don't see it from this big high up place staring down at it you experience it in your life wow this is a must read book I, and i want listeners to know that it's called no ordinary assignment and to me it's like a modern day western you're out there in that wild west and you're you're getting the story and you're bringing it back to people it is such a great summer read thank you very much you got to come back to this show anytime the door is always going to be open for you i would love that excellent will you be brilliant today okay you too thanks so much